Have you ever thought about getting your MBA? Well, the University of Louisville offers the only MBA with a distilled spirits focus. Graduate in under two years with both your master's and a certificate in the distilled spirits business at no extra time or cost. This unbeatable combination will prepare you to achieve greater success through deepened understanding on the business side of the industry, like finance, marketing, and operations. Again, this is 100% online, and all that's required is a bachelor's degree. Go to uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. Are you looking for great gift ideas this holiday season? Then you need to check out Penelope Bourbon's award-winning four-grain and barrel-strength expressions. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced flavor profile is the perfect palate pleaser this holiday season. Order both expressions today on sealbox.com and receive free shipping using promo code Penelope Pursuit. That's Penelope Pursuit on sealbox.com and give the perfect gift this year. You know, Jordan, Blake, and Brian, uh, I mean, just, just three of the greatest people in bourbon. I, I love these three guys. Ooh, guys, you should probably well, yeah, get the I, greatest three yeah. people. I feel like I'm going to be asked to, like, uh, you know, come help them move next week or something. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. It's episode 282 of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon that features news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. Before we start today's podcast with the last roundtable of 2020, here's your weekly bourbon news update. And don't forget, repeal day is coming up on December 5th, and you can get signed up to also get your free bottle of the Jack Daniels. Go to repealdayexpo.com to get your tickets. It's that time of also the year again for interesting gift ideas. And we posted our favorites of 2020 on all of our socials, including the Aged and Or Spirits flight that you can get signed up right now on Kickstarter at bourbonpursuit.com slash flight. There's also a new $60 million expansion that will be happening at Jim Beam, all focused on the visitor experience. This will include a new retail center, a restaurant, an enhanced and immersive visual education experience showcasing how to make bourbon the Beam way, and the Fred Beano Craft Distillery, which will be the new home for the small batch and the next generation whiskeys. Construction is expected to be completed by mid-2021. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Woodford Reserve is releasing its oldest bourbon ever. Woodford Reserve, very fine rare bourbon, is the next release in the 2020 Masters Collection. This includes 17-year-old bourbon and dates to 2003. There's also a change to the packaging and the bottle in itself moving away from the traditional pot still look and now modernizing it with more of a rounder oval shape, if you will. It's bottled at the standard Woodford 90.4 proof and will have an SRP of $130. Widow Jane is releasing its 2020 The Vault. The 2020 release is a marriage of 15 to 17 year old Tennessee and Indiana bourbons from barrels that were handpicked from the Widow Jane Rickhouse stocks on Conover Street in Red Hook, Brooklyn. It is also blended by Widow Jane president, distiller, and blender, Lisa Wicker. Just over 5,000 bottles of the Vaults 2020 are being released at 99 proof with a $200 suggested retail price. December is also going to be a big month for us at Pursuit Spirits. There are going to be six, yes, six barrels of Pursuit series that are going to be released in December. Episode 34 is a private barrel selection by a group called Sacred Sippers. And this will be our very first of a new distillery that we're adding to our portfolio. It's undisclosed from Tennessee, but not from Tullahoma, but it is so good and so dark. And we've got a lot of these great barrels on the way that it's going to surprise a ton of people. Episodes 35 and 36 will be available first to our Patreon community. And these barrels are in collaboration with Starlight Distillery out of Indiana. One is a straight bourbon and the other is a bourbon finished in apple brandy casks. Episode 37 is a 10-year-old that will be available in specs locations across the state of Texas. And episode 38 is an 11-year-old that will be available at retailers across the state of Tennessee. And episode 39 is a four-year rye that is a private barrel selection that will only be available to Mulligans and elite retail stores in the state of Tennessee. And of course, Pursuit United will be available for pre-purchase to our Patreon community, but will not make its way out to market until January of 2021. Well, as I'd mentioned, it's the last round table of 2020, and we discuss what were the hits and misses of bourbon releases this year. Most of the time we're in agreement, but every once in a while, there's one that tears the group apart. 
And Fred goes deep on some interesting history with barrel entry proof and weeded bourbons. Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to get their unique cash strength whiskeys from around the world. Visit BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. Bourbon to your door. It's as easy as that. Well, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Back in the 1960s, as vodka was starting to take over the spirits industry and everybody was drinking vodka and replacing bourbon with vodka, and distillers were trying to figure out what to do, they were caught flat-footed. Up until 1958, vodka didn't even have a federal definition. So the distillers had this plan, like, let's create a style of whiskey that is actually similar to vodka, and maybe that will slow down the growth of vodka. They created a a style of whiskey called light whiskey, and it meant it was distilled at higher proof points, so more flavor was stripped out of it, and it could go into used barrels, so they were not uh, beholden to the the new chart oak laws in the United States. Well, at first, people were really adaptive to it. They were like, oh, yeah, I'll give this a shot. Oh, this makes a fine highball. Of course, there was millions of dollars of marketing behind it. But after year two, it was really, really a failure. You would see things like Crow Light. There was all these, uh, you know, brands that were created uh, around the category. And essentially, they just all fell out of favor except at one distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. They continued making light whiskey, and they were sending it up to Canada to be a part of the blends. To this day, MGP Ingredients, which is that same distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, it, uh, it's making light whiskey. And forever, they've been trying to shove light whiskey down our throats uh, in the source whiskey market. But here's the thing. Nobody really likes it. Well... Maybe the 14-year-old stuff's okay, but for the most part, light whiskey is just that, kind of flavorless. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, that idea actually came from a tweet in 2019 from Bourbon Dog at BJZYK. So thank you, Bourbon Dog. I don't know how that tweet ended up in my 2020 um, browsing, but it did. And I thank you for that because... I've always liked talking about the history of light whiskey. But that's going to do it. Be safe out there, everybody. Cheers. Welcome, everybody. It is Bourbon Community Roundtable number 51. Kenny and Fred here tonight. We are missing our people's champ. He is somewhere in the backwoods of North Carolina, drinking stag for $20 a pour and just kind of hanging out and camping or doing something. But uh, wish him all the best. He's always somewhere doing something fun. But you've got you've got two of the three here tonight, and we're going to be wrapping this up as the last roundtable of 2020. And we've got some some fun topics, some fun things that we want to kind of hit on. Really, kind of looking at you know the really the releases this year. We're not going to get into you know whose was the best favorite whiskey of 2020, but instead we're going to kind of go through like a, a good chunk of them and kind of give them our thoughts towards the end of the year as kind of a a good end of the year summary. Fred, how are you doing tonight? Man, Kenny, I couldn't be better. I, um, I'm so excited about everything that's going on, and it's always great to see you know, Jordan, Blake, and Brian. Uh, I mean, just, just three of the greatest people in bourbon. I, I love these three guys. Ooh, guys, you should probably well, yeah, get the three I, greatest three yeah. people. I feel like I'm going to be asked to, like, uh, you know, come help them move next week or something. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, like, you have a pickup truck, right? <laughs> See, wait, just on helping him move that room behind him. Yeah. Wait, yeah, wait, that, that wait. Do you, for. Blake? Do you have a pickup truck? I'm curious. I, I do. I do. I can bring it yeah. up to Kentucky. You need. Yeah. You need. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So before we get into it, I always want to start off something with kind of fun and a little bit lighthearted getting into it. And and so, Fred, I'll kind of go to you first. So Black Friday just wrapped up last Mm -hmm. week. And, you know, it's been weird because usually Black Friday was actually on Black Friday. And now everybody's like, oh, first week in November, let's start our Black Friday deals. And it's it doesn't really seem like it's Black Friday more. Now, Black Friday extends till Monday. There's really nobody going to stores anymore. It's all online. But for you, did you purchase anything for Black Friday? Maybe for yourself or your wife or kids or anything like that? Anything fun? 
I did. I did. I got. I got a. I got myself a uh, a workout bench, and I've been uh, when when the second surge came and the and the governor started like clamping down, like he's been doing. Uh, and I just basically was like, and then and then the gym was like, you got to wear your mask while you're working. I'm like, fuck that. I can't work out and wear my mask. And I'm a fatty trying to get back on the on the workout you know, on the workout routine. I was in a good spot really before COVID then COVID and hit. And then fatty McFat fat just started getting around the belly train and everywhere else on my body. And <laughs> the, the one area where I can really make some progress is lifting weights. And, uh, we've got a, all cardio equipment in the house. And I saw uh, on Amazon, I saw these, uh, these workout benches started popping up and I was like, I'm going to get that and come to find out my wife had bought me one of those for Christmas. So she had, <laughs> so I got, a, I got a, I, I bought something for myself that she bought for me. So that just tells you how great she is as a gift buyer for me. That or, or she was trying to tell you something. I don't know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary oh i know i know i don't I, you know i don't mean it listen, you know, it's, it's, listen blake kenny you you kenny and jordan i feel like brian can go a little bit my way I feel like <laughs> you, you might you might be able to get a little bit of rotundness on you from time to time but those those three at the top there they got the skinny gene we didn't get i, I don't I, I didn't get the skinny gene <laughs> well it comes it comes at a cost you know we can't we can't eat a lot of good food you know we got to put the sugar down it's it's just part of what it is so but you know i'm surprised <laughs> you really get a lot of getting the workout equipment i i remember when you know this whole thing first started it was actually really hard to find mm. any workout equipment yeah, i mean it took me a while it. to get some some mm. dumbbells and everything like that but yeah i'm with you i'm totally with you all right well let's let's kind of keep this going around the horn here jordan i'll let you go next and introduce and any, any yeah, black sure. shopping? Yeah, yeah. So I'm Jordan, one of the three guys from Breaking Bourbon, breakingbourbon.com. Um, we are one of the largest bourbon review websites in the world. So check us out if you haven't been there already. We'd be more than happy to direct you some good bourbon American whiskey to buy. In terms of buying on Black Friday, I feel like I bought every single day last week except Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so I did try and support some local distilleries, right? So I'm in Pittsburgh. So I tried to support some local distilleries with some purchases because I feel like I've been buying nothing but frivolous things for myself. So trying to help out some small businesses around here instead. So made sure to support Wiggle Whiskey here in Pittsburgh, which has been really nice. There you go. Always looking out for small business Saturday too. Cool, while we're yeah. Speaking of small business Saturday, Blake. <laughs> yeah. Come on over to Sealbox. <laughs> uh, no, let's see. Um, I'm kind of bad. I'm a, I'm can be a little of an impulsive buyer at times. Um, so I, I I'm kind of like Jordan. I didn't, I, I bought all the black Friday stuff throughout the week. It just seemed like every day of the week. It's like, have you seen our black Fridays yet? And like, I'm pretty sure it's Tuesday, but okay. Well, so well, I bought a Blackstone griddle. Um, oh man. Everybody's nice. about that right now. They're that making, was, making smash and, burgers out in the back. Yeah. Of the an incredible purchase actually highly recommend that. Um, and then I bought a I bought a whole ham um, from Newsome Ham in Kentucky. I guess that's not nice. it was for a Black Friday uh, thing, so maybe that counts. Uh, and then went with you know my my typical only Black Friday purchase, which is a Bourbon County Stout. So didn't really didn't really go after it too much this year. Just bought two of the regular, uh, none of the variants, and yeah, haven't haven't cracked it open yet. The uh, first bottle was lost. I was actually reaching for my glass and like calamity of errors as I'm reaching up the bottom of my shirt snags the top of the bottle shatters on the floor like the kitchen probably still smells like bourbon county stout because that stuff is just so thick and like seeps in but um no so that was my only true black friday uh purchase was the bourbon county stout and rest in peace, those tiles. You'll have to get that soy sauce out of there yeah. at some point. Oh, it's wood floors. Oh. It just blends right in. It kind of like, uh, it, yeah. it gave it a nice push it in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I still have my uh, stouts from uh, like last year and two years ago. I've just never been a fan of those. I'm just not one of those people on that type train. Oh, I yeah, am, I am hardcore my, on it. It drives my wife yeah. crazy because I, like I've stocked up on them for 
qu quite a few years. And like, so I drank a 2014 the other day and every year, whenever I tell her, I'm like, all right, I'm headed out and then go pick up. She's like, why? We have all these other bottles. I'm like, well, I need every year's release though. So, so. <laughs> True story. Hey, I'm, I'm open to a trade if you yeah, want. You yeah, want I, I, may, uh, I may hit you up. What you got in the bunker there, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> they steer with his truck. Mellow you know, out of time pretty well. They do. The yeah. The coffee I had from 2014, I ended up drinking that on uh, yesterday. And it, it was much better than I remember. You know, what I drank six years ago, I guess, as well as we can all remember what we drank six years ago. But um, they do age well. Yeah, that's what. I, so I'm a big fan of Bourbon County Stouts too. Everybody probably heard the podcast we released. Uh, I think what last, actually two weeks ago, maybe it was last week, whatever it was. Huge fan of them. I kind of did exactly what you did, Blake. I usually go out going crazy trying to buy a bunch of stuff, but I've got as you probably like you all probably like you know 24 bottles up in the basement, and I had no reason to go buy a bunch of stuff. So I was like, I'm only going to go for like the two variants. I just want to get the birthday and the Weller variant. That's it. And I drove around to probably like 10 places, struck out until I got to the last store and I got one birthday and then like the the Carmelo wheat. Still didn't get the uh, the Weller, but it's fine. I'll live. I just wanted to try at least those two. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I see thirty dollars of thirty dollars a beer though, you're kinda like, oh gosh, it still kind of hits you a little bit. Yeah. It, it does. It's crazy. Even the um, I think I paid it was essentially 20 bucks after taxes almost for one of just the regulars. And I'm pretty sure that's what a four pack was back in the day. What they move 2015 or 2016 to the, the bomber bottles. 2015. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's an expensive, I mean, I guess we, as bourbon guys, we can't complain about cost and price all that much, but it's like a bottle of wine, you know, it, uh, you get the really good bottle for 15 bucks of wine. So <laughs> <laughs> true, true. And that's why I've been going to the, uh, the founders. I mean, they've had some really, really good releases. And I saw a comment yeah. there from Nick that he just had the KBS Mackinac. I had that this past weekend too, or I guess during the week. And it's like, it's a Tootsie roll. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's really good. And they're, they've got the CBS and the yes, KBS it's out. It's just so good. I Ooh. mean, you can't go wrong with those little four packs and the bottles are better size. Brian, you got bit by the uh, stout bug pretty hard a couple of years ago, didn't you? you, you... Really hard. I, I was yeah. kind of late to the game, but then uh, it was really the, the stout that we did um, mm -hmm. launched me and my teaser for it was a, uh, was a Willet, Willet stout that I had that mm -hmm. Drew just had a few of and uh they were just fantastic and part of it's drinking at the bar at willet but then that was so great and then went over to kenny's when we got our when we got our crowlers and uh that was fantastic and ever since then i've just been on the train now that you chimed in what, what else did you buy for black friday who are you by the way well, yeah so I, I i try to stay away from black friday this year every year uh, plus, I can't really say what I have been buying because my wife's birthday is in December and then on, on Christmas on top of that. So what I bought for for ourselves, I got one of the Brio smokeless fire pits. Hmm. So that should be uh, that's I think Jordan's backyard is where they make make those somewhere out in the neck of the woods. <laughs> and uh, they're just they everything I've heard about them is is they're great. You know, the, I think a lot of people are getting the solos. Uh, this one's a little bit bigger and it has a rim on it that heats up that you can you can cook your steak on this rim that goes around the fire pit. So oh, that's, that's what cool. I'm headed for. Cool. Yeah. Nice. So, so how does that and this may be um, above our pay grade, but how does that work with the smokeless? It just gets it so hot that there's no smoke or is there some kind of other? There's, yeah, there's some kind of ventilation system. So it it. There's higher combustion rate, and they end up saying it's 98% smoke free. Yeah, yeah so it'll you'll see, like once you get it going, Brian, it gets really hot in the way, like it just sucks in the air from the bottom and burns up top. It, it, those become really smokeless. They're awesome. Yeah, oh, I don't know play, about but. I don't know about you, about you, Blake and Kenny. I, I want to see the smoke rise. Yeah, I, I want to <laughs> smell like a fire after I walk in for two days. You know, I want <laughs> to wash my hair four times just to not. <laughs> I, I want to have to move around the fire pit like five yeah. times as the wind changes. I want to be able to drop the joke whenever it's blowing, the smoke's blowing at someone else that, you know, uh, smoke only falls ugly. You know, I want to be able to use that line at every bonfire I go to. 
<laughs> oh man, that's that's good stuff right there. So before we kind of dive into it, I want Fred to kind of give a, a little bit of shout about Repeal Day because by the time this airs on Thursday, you're gonna be joining us uh, on Saturday for yeah. one of the largest virtual events that's been happening. So Fred, why don't you give a little plug for it? Real yeah. Quick. So the Repeal Day Expo, uh, everybody here is a part of it. Uh, December 5th is repeal day. It's a celebration of the repeal of prohibition, which happened December 5th, 1933. And, you know, Brian, you and I, we've, you know, we've been at local events through, throughout our careers. And it, it's, it, this is something that there's just, we always do. We like get together and we party on December 5th. And the best parties of my life have been on December 5th, celebrating re the repeal of prohibition. And it's what the alcohol industry does. Uh, but with COVID, you know, we didn't have a place to go to. So I decided to like create like an actual like expo in like an expo hall. And we've all been doing these zoom tastings. We've all been doing a lot of fun stuff virtually. And I, I just, I wanted, I wanted something that was a little different. So I, 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 I partnered with a, a company called Deggy world. And what Deggy world is, is basically like the Sims. Um, it's basically like a video game inside, inside a world. You get to walk around and, uh, you know, talk to distillers. There's going to be panels. Uh, Brian's doing a panel on the, the legalities of, uh, prohibition and the repeal of it. Uh, Blake's doing a panel on, uh, craft spirits. Uh, Jordan and, um, and Kenny are both doing panels on, on, on hype stuff like basically like you know talking shit on blanton's mostly probably for 30 minutes <laughs> but um um but so that that's a little bit of it but i also have music so just booked uh chase rice uh who's a mega country singer uh Lindsay l uh sean james who's a blues rocker uh kelly swindoll tyler boone and DJ Duke, uh, my favorite uh, bluegrass band, Steel Wheels, and uh, a few others. And it's just like you go around and you kind of like get to hang out with people. You, you could go to repealdayexpo.com and see more about it. But every ticket holder gets a bottle of Jack Daniels. Well, that may not seem like much uh, for those who are ultra bourbon geeks. The, this, this ticket is 20 bucks. And basically a bottle of Jack is more than that. And those who came in early, the double platinum already sold out. They got a bottle of New Riff and a bottle of uh, Jack Daniels Barrel Proof. But, uh, you know, come on in. You know, we've got a lot of cool stuff, um, you know, planned. And I I'm so excited that everybody here is a part of it. This is, this is also like, um, you know, I've always been like a, kind of like helping other event producers like put on stuff like bourbon and beyond like i'm a co-founder of it but i don't own it this is the first show that i solely own and that i'm a part of that i that is all mine this is all my money this is all me um and i'm just excited about it you know the one thing that i'm really looking forward to is i heard there's an easter egg that if you look really hard and you try to go around the world enough um there's a a character of Ryan Cecil actually streaking through the quad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rumor, but we, I hear it may happen in the ocean. You do. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it'll be fun. I can't wait to see everybody there uh, this Saturday. It'll be uh, really awesome just to kind of interact with you all too. So now, sure Kenny, have, have you this. been in, have you been in the world yet? I have not because I've missed all of the emails that says you need to join this day to get the intro, but I, I, I'm a tech guy. I could figure it out. I'm not worried about it. Now, I know, Jordan, you have. Yeah, I've been in there a few times now, Fred. It's super cool. I think everyone who signs up is going to have a really fun time. I think the world's awesome the way you have it set up, the different stages, the different expo halls, the theaters. So you're going to be able to watch all the different lectures and just being able to interact with brands and even just with each other. It's going to be awesome. It's What a better way to spend a Saturday. Right on, man. Cool. Yep, I'm and signed up, too. I've got my avatar. I've, I'm all set. Ready, ready to roll. Appreciate you having me, Fred. Now, Blake, we did have a few issues with your uh, internet getting your presentation over. <laughs> I was yeah. this was so I got mine in. I thought I could do it live uh, to defend myself a little bit. So then I recorded it, and it is 
2.6 gigs. So I don't know if I recorded it in like the highest possible quality. So I've tried to compress it. Um, yeah, I got a little bit of work to do after we, we jump off air tonight. To I put it in like I, I zip filed it. Uh, I know that's probably the wrong lingo for the tech guys, uh, but keep going. In, this is this is cute. Yeah, yeah keep going. File, and it went from like 2.6 gigs to 2.57 gigs. I'm like, well, that didn't help me. <laughs> So well, that, uh, that's actually not that big in terms of a file for video, but, uh, you know, we okay, were well, rich. I was originally going to do a lot of stuff live. And then mm -hmm. as I was like looking at all the different, like, cause I have, to manage, to. I have to manage all the stages and everything. I was like, yeah. you know, I think I'm going to have to like, keep it, you know, get as many recorded and then have you all do like Q and A's afterward. So, yeah, that's probably the best decision, um, to try to, not have to maintain every single thing, but yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> I, I guarantee you, you'll, you'll get tech support figured out here, but let's go ahead. Let's, let's kind of dive into the meat of the podcast today. And what we're going to do is kind of look at hit or misses. And I'm going to kind of go through a list of releases that all happened in 2020. Some were minor, some were limited releases, some are ongoing, and we'll just kind of like give our thoughts on, on each one. Mm -hmm. And the first one was at the very beginning of 2020, there was a new release of a Rye at a $30 price point, which was something that maybe we were kind of anticipating was going to happen eventually, but we didn't know when, and that is the Elijah Craig Rye. So this is, of course, going to be a, the same exact mash bill and everything that you're probably going to find in Pikesville. Lower proof point, lower price point. So in terms, and I'll let whoever wants to speak up, you know, was Elijah Craig Rye, was it a hit or a miss for you all? It, did it get distributed nationally? I feel like it hasn't popped up in a lot of places yet, but I could just be thinking of the toasted. Um, but, I, you know, e either way, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but it's it's kind of hard to knock uh, an addition to the Rye category at that price point. So it's... It, for me, it wasn't a hit, um, but you know, it's. It, I'm also not going to be out, come out and be like, "What the heck? Uh, this is terrible decision from Heaven Hill." You know, you're you're ruining the industry. You know, it wasn't that at all either. I think it's cool they could, you know, kind of spin off the Elijah Craig brand a little bit, take a take a note out of Sazerac's um, playbook with the Weller brand. Um, and some of their other stuff. And so just kind of expand uh, Elijah Craig a little more. And so, you know, it's just one more thing that you can grab in a pinch. But overall, I wasn't like that impressed. I'd rather just grab Rittenhouse and especially Pikesville. I mean, I think Pikesville is actually fantastic. And this was just mediocre to me. I think when we look at the like the totality of the year for releases, th this wasn't the best. It wasn't the worst. I was very excited about the price point. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what was it, Kenny? 30, like 30 bucks. That's 30 usual, bucks. Yeah. usual Elijah Craig stance. Yeah. I mean, if you put anything out at 30 bucks right now, I'm just, I'm not going to get mad at you. If yeah. you mean, yeah, I mean, it, I'm just not, it's, it, it's, it, it was, it was good enough to, to appeal to a lot, not better than Pikesville. And I'll agree with you on that, Blake. It like the Rittenhouse bottom bond definitely better, but mm -hmm. it, I think that came in at ninety four proof. The the Elijah Craig Ryan, if I, memory serves, right. and it, and it was just it was just it was it was good, not great, maybe okay to good, but again, you know, Heaven Hill's gotten a lot of shit for some price points lately. You don't have to. I mean, you can go in that Reddit thread that was just destroying them the other day. And like, I think you can, you can point to this release as something that is, uh, is an example of them being conscious of, of price point, because how many people are bringing out a, a well-aged rye at 30 bucks right now? It's just not, it's not happening. I mean, that yeah. was, that's I mean, so, even, even two to three sourced MGP 95, five is more expensive than this. Yep. Oh, yeah. Much exactly. more. yeah. 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 So from a price alone, it's a hit for me. Not, not necessarily my favorite thing, but I love the price. I, I did like it better than the Rittenhouse, but I'm with you guys on Pikesville. I've I've been such a big fan of Pikesville since it came out. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough to to top that for me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the what we'll see when we're done, Kenny, going through all of the new releases, we've got an Elijah Craig theme here building. So I'm glad that Elijah Craig was one of your first ones. 
because we're going to be hearing that name come up a lot as you're talking about new releases. And that's, that's I think, where the news is, that with Heaven Hill making such a push on all of the different Elijah Craig brands that, that they put out this year. Yeah, Don't I'm put right the cart before the horse there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, he's, he's just got a, he's got a jury in front of him. And he's got to like put you know present his like opening testimony here or whatever. You got to tell the jury what they're going to hear. There you go. Like he no, saw think, my notes before we started or something. I, I think <laughs> hey. it's exact same thing everyone else said, right? So this was a uh, price can't knock the price. Thirty bucks, gotta love it. It's a take or leave it ride, though, right? You're not going to be disappointed if you spend thirty bucks, but you're also going to know that you didn't get anything great either, right? It's just a just an average ride for thirty bucks. There's there's Rittenhouse I take ahead of this for less. But um, if you're a fan of Heaven Hill and you like their mash bills, yeah, it was a great, great release for you. All right. So we'll move on to the next one. And why does well, we let's just stick with with Heaven Hill, because the next one is we're very, very familiar that Elijah Craig Barrel Proof came out. But this was the first year they started doing Larceny Barrel Proof. Now, for me, I'll kind of go ahead and start this off. I think this was a hit because. Larceny was it was good for what it was a forty five dollar weeded category great and you know what six six year span or six year age range. Uh, however, for most of us and I think we can kind of say the same thing with Elijah Craig Rye, it doesn't really like hit a lot of the points where like yeah I've got to go out got to get larceny got to do this. However, larceny barrel proof I think you know and depending on there were you know three releases not all of them were home runs. However. Attempting to bring out a barrel proof version of it, I think was was a good move by them. It speaks to another part of the consumer market here, which is us, where we're excited to be able to try something like that. You know, I don't know how many weeded cast strength bourbons that are six years old are out on the market at fifty to sixty five dollars or whatever it is. So I think it's a again, it comes back down to price form, but at the same exact time, it's pretty good whiskey to follow it up to. And I think, you know, it's funny because I would just right before we hopped on here, wrapped up a review of the new C920 that's going to be on the website next week. And I think they've actually, you know, each batch was different. And I think they're ending the year really strong. It's just for the price, the the whiskey inside, right? If you're a lover of weeded bourbons or just barrel proof bourbons, man, it's a hard combo to beat, right? It, it's pretty damn tasty. And I think a lot of people should be pleased that they're putting it out at this price point because I honestly think they could have charged more and people wouldn't complain about it either. But I think it's probably one of the you know better barrel proof bourbons out there at the price point, and its brother Elijah Craig Barrel Proof is right there with it, so they're crushing it in that category. Agreed. You know, it's funny. It's like you say, like people wouldn't be upset about it, but you know, they come out with the Heaven Hill Single Barrel, which again, putting the cart before the horse. Sorry, Kenny. <laughs> Actually, I'm not uh, going to. I'm not going to talk about this. We talk about the new, oh, the 13 year that they. Yeah, yeah, they put yeah. that out. It was a 300 dollars one. They got destroyed. For that price point, and I don't think I don't think that price point was necessarily off for the demand uh, of that particular type of whiskey, which is fantastic. But the 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 larceny barrel, the very first one was like really bad to me. Like I didn't like it at all. Uh, the B series was better. The C series was more in line with what the B was. But Jordan, I'm with you, man. They were all three very different. And if that is what we can expect out of this, if 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 we have a variance of a um of say twenty percent with the larceny barrel proof moving forward, sign me up for being excited because I love tasting things and 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 finding like a difference between them. What I hate is is when everything is so similar. Like I love the William Larue Weller. But there's there there's about a there's probably a, a a ten degree separation from the BTAC series for the last ten years, and that's a very hard qualifier. Like you, I could make a case that every single one of the William Lou Wellers of the last ten years should have been on my uh, best bourbons of the century uh, of of this so far. But you know, yeah, to like there's some separation there, but they were all so close. And so if Weller has, or if Larson, he has a little bit of that single barrel effect where there's some difference, there's some uniqueness, man, that gets me really excited about, about that particular line. Definitely. Anybody else? Final closing yeah, remark. I'll, I'll take, I'll take the counterpoint. I, I didn't love the Larceny um, barrel proof. It, it, it it falls into the similar category as the rye for me, like on paper for the price, for what it is like, I think it's good. 
I really like that Heaven Hill is doing these things and they continue. Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, I still think, is probably one of the top things you can buy today just because of price and age and barrel proof and it's really good. Um, but for whatever reason, I've never been a huge fan of the Heaven Hill weeded mash bill. You know, I've had I've had some things from the weeded mash bill that I like, but um, didn't love batch one on Larceny. Batch two, I thought it was a little bit better, but still not great. But, you know, kind of for the price. Um, and, and I have a feeling uh, the one from Heaven Hill that I actually did really like was not a favorite with most people, which was the toasted. Um, so, um, yeah, a lot of people didn't like that one, but I actually really liked the toasted barrel. So I don't know, maybe my palate's broken. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, the, the larceny didn't do it for me. I actually you saw know, it on the shelf and passed. So, you know, Blake, I think, I think this is a good moment to like kind of talk about how like Heaven Hills, like weeded bourbons are very different from everybody else. Let's talk about ice balls versus ice cubes. It's all about physics and volume and surface area. Did you know that an ice ball has 24% less surface area compared to the same volume of ice in a cube form? Well, less surface area exposed to warm liquid means a slower ice melt and less drink dilution without sacrificing any chilling power. And the coolest way to make ice balls is with a meltdown ice ball press. First, you take some ice in the provided silicone cups. You place this ice into meltdown and watch as the conduction from copper or aluminum melts the ice right in front of you. You can literally see the melted water cascade down the sides. And in a minute, you've got a perfect ice ball to put in your drink. Meltdown, it's the perfect solution to dilution pollution. You can use promo code PURSUIT to receive $100 off. So check it out now at MeltdownIce.com. Are you looking to improve your palate and create your own at-home tasting experience? Well, the folks at Aged and Ore, they're back at it again and now they're introducing a new innovative spirits flight on Kickstarter this month. Each glass has half ounce pour indicators and no scratch paper is required to identify the bourbons during this blind tasting. It's small profile and makes for easy to store in any home bar. Go and learn more right now and get signed up at spiritsflight.com. Attention private pick enthusiasts, whiskey geek retailers, and aspiring bourbon brand owners. Go to Krogmans.com today to get started with one of the most unique barrel selections in the business, where everything, it's catered to you. Dream up any label or idea that you want, and they can make it happen. So if you're tired of settling for awkward stickers on the sides of bottles, Krogman's Barrel Picks lets you have total control over your design from start to finish. With low minimums and quick turnaround times, Krogman's can take your pick to the retailer of your choice, ASAP. Go to Krogman's.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S dot com to get started. I think this is a good moment to like kind of talk about how like Heaven Hills, like weeded bourbons are very different from everybody else. Uh, historically, the weeded bourbons go in a barrel, go in the barrel at the lowest entry proof. And uh, Heaven Hill abides by the fact that they need to, you know, they're, they believe in like everything's 125 proof going in the barrel. So those weeded bourbons, unlike um, uh, Buffalo Trace, mm -hmm. you know, uh, unlike, you know, Sits Weller previously, unlike Maker's Mark, you know, they're they're going in at, at the highest absolute proof uh, that you can go into the barrel. And I and, and you talk to these old distillers like, you know, I remember talking to Ed Foote about this. Um, you know, I've, I've talked to. Um, you know, Bill Samuels and some of the older distillers and makers, Mark, Dave Pickerel talked about this a lot too, is like weed is a much more sensitive grain. And if you, if you just, if you don't, if you don't like cut it with a good amount of water to put in the barrel, then that it, it doesn't react well inside the barrel. Now there's chemical, chemical things that go along with it, but that might be why those, um, those weeded bourbons from heaven hill aren't doing it for you and that is almost the exact taste i get like i just get way more char and and it feels overpowered there's there's no soft fruit there's no um some of that kind of stuff so yeah that that makes sense it, it makes my point seem legitimate and logical rather than just me like eh. <laughs> but don't encourage it yeah what is their what is their reasoning for that they just 
you know, they just think everything's the standard 125 because, I mean. No, yeah. I mean, it's it's like if you take a look at their facilities, um, you know, the a few things about Heaven Hill is, you know, first of all, let's let's all be very honest. They make great whiskey. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the other thing is, is they are very cost efficient. And to yep. go into the barrel at a, at a at a low entry proof is very expensive. Mm-hmm. And and like, you know, old 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 Fitzgerald was a bit of a when they when they acquired that from uh, United Distillers, their Stitzel Weller facility, then called Old Fitzgerald, when they ca- when they acquired Old Fitzgerald, they weren't I mean, they, they also, you know, they had just uh, their distillery had just burned down. And they, you know, in 1996, and they acquired the Bernheim Distillery at the same time. You know, they're not looking at like um, historical measurements for barrel entry proof. They're looking at survival at that point, and they kind of get into the rotation and they get into like a system where 125 barrel entry proof is their way, and they just continued down that track, and and they just they're not one to necessarily you know, change a little bit. Now they will may experiment from time to time. They experimented at like their craft distiller distillery downtown. But, you know, I mean, they're a large facility and they just like stick into the 125 entry proof. And, you know, frankly, the, the old Fitzgerald, you know, and I also, uh, to that point, I feel like the old Fitzgerald decanters, uh, I think they hurt by having 125 barrel entry proof. So I, I don't think you're wrong, Blake, with that. Uh, but I do I do think there are a couple gems in yeah, the, uh, for sure. In, in I, I mean, the, I've had a few of those decanters that because more of the nine year range that I actually liked. Um, but yeah, you know, to to each his own on, on those because I love Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, so I, I can't knock them for for uh, others. Well, that was a lot longer discussion about larceny and barrel proof entry that I thought we were going to get into. <laughs> it's good information. Sorry. It was. No, 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 no. Keep it Put going. It's together good. on their barrel entry because I'm sure I've probably seen that somewhere, but never really put two and two together that, yeah, everybody else is lowering the, the entry proof. You know, what uh, Weller's at 113 or 114, is it? Yeah. So that's interesting. You know, so and I think that I think that's one of the things too. I'm sorry, Kenny, but I think that's one of the reasons why old turkey is so fascinating to so many of us. It's because that was uh, a lower barrel entry proof before Pernod Ricard and then later Campari like raised the barrel entry proof. Like those, like I, I think that is like the one like thing to whiskey, uh, in American whiskey, especially that we just can we just we we focus on mash bills, but we don't focus on as much as we should on yeast and we don't focus as much as we should on barrel entry proofs. And I think those are two things that we are always missing the bar on in this world. And, you know, in heaven Hill does use a dry yeast, whereas a lot of other people use propagated yeast. And I think there's a lot of things that could go into that flavor profile. And, um, you, you get a lot of cross. You just, you just, Nailed two things from Wilderness Trail, and that's yeah, you know, that's maybe my story of the year is what I've really been falling in love with. And they've got they, along with Peerless, have really low barrel entry, entry proof, and of course, they know every damn thing there is to know about yeast. So, it's some going to be some really impressive stuff coming out of both. It's of them. also why we need craft distilleries, like I'll be talking about on Repeal Day on December 4th from Fred Minix. <laughs> December 5th. Yeah. December 5th. 5th. Yeah. 5th. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't show up a day early. <laughs> You'll just be there December 4th waiting to get in like a concert. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're just first in line. So there's there's uh, another one I kind of want to bring up. And I think it's pretty interesting because I think the whole world discovered it. And that's Bell Mead Honey Cask. And I think people are just discovering the honey cask. Now, I know not everybody probably got a chance to try it. We had an opportunity to actually go down and go down to Nelson Greenbrier and try it ourselves. Pretty fascinating. I know there's other groups out there that are actually taking their own whiskey and like rebarreling it into honey barrels and stuff. What do you all think? Honey barrels, hit or miss? Huge fan of this line, right? Yeah. I've been a fan of it since they've been starting it off. I think it's a fascinating experiment they have going on. It adds just a different dimension to the whiskey inside. Definitely definitely worth everyone trying once i haven't had it guys i need to just listen to you guys 
Yeah, I've got it. And then um, a local distillery here, Manifest, started playing around with some honey barrels. And it, it really pairs nicely. I mean, and, and it's kind of a interesting historical thing when you think about it. Uh, wild Turkey, the honey liqueur was actually the first that I know of flavored bourbon or whiskey that ever came out. So it's kind of a interesting nod to the older times as well. So I, I like it. Yeah, I didn't like the fact that it it garnered way too much attention on the secondary market and prices went astronomical through the roof. I think the whiskey was good for what it is. It's still a finished bourbon at the end of the day or finished whiskey. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's, you know, not going to be something for the pure of pure breeds, if you will. Kenny, since we're on a uh, on on uh, since you've got us on a leash for how long we can talk. I will not. I will. I will waive the historical uh, discussion regarding the use of honey in in American whiskey, and we'll just simply say I like the honey cask. This is not a honey flavored. This is a honey mm -hmm. cask finish. And what happened was the a uh, a naviary took uh, cask and aged honey in it, and then sold them to. Uh, Nelson Greenbrier, I think it's one of the most beautiful things that has happened. I will only say I fucking hate the use of bourbon on the in terms of a, a term on the labeling of barrel finishes. I love the category. I love what it's doing. I just hate bringing bourbon in the term of it because it, the, at some point we are going to lose that geographical protection because we don't have it in our own country of what bourbon is. Not to say that what Nelson Greenbrier is doing is calling it bourbon, because it's not. But like I said, I'm going to waive my uh, historical... I mean, this was this was short for me, Kenny, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> this was short. So I'm just going to shut up. <laughs> we, 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 all, we, all know where we all know where you're standing on it. We'll let you, we'll let you do your, uh, your rant some other time for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next one, Blanton's Gold and Straight from the Barrel coming to the United States. For me, I think it's a miss. I, think, I, I hate it because it's just... It stirs everything up already that's going mad in the Blanton's world. You didn't need to do it anymore. I liked it when the fact that either I could travel internationally or I knew somebody international, and if I wanted a bottle, I could get a bottle. Now it comes here, and it's actually close to secondary. It's almost cheaper to actually get it shipped from you know the Netherlands or Masters of Malt or whatever and get it here than it is to actually pay retail at a store near you. Near you. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a lose lose situation for you know Buffalo Trace and Sazerac and Ancient Age. It, they've been people have been just been pounding them for years about hey when are we going to get it here? And then whenever we bring it here, it's like well what the heck? It just caused more problems. So um, I, I mean I think it's cool to have more variations of Blantons here, but um, it's just one more bottle that's going to get. Uh, the, the price jacked up and won't be on shelf. So um, I think it was good intentions, but you know, from an overall consumer standpoint, it's, it's not going to affect my uh, drinking or buying habits. So same. See, I really, I actually Blanton's gold is my favorite Blanton's line. It's been that way for a long time. And had this come out any other time, I would have been like, yeah, this is great. But I think yeah. Buffalo Trace, you know, people have been, like you said, like knocking on their doors for a long time, but they chose to release it during this time. Right during everything going on with trade wars. And it's just, I mean, they kind of did it for the wrong reasons. They didn't do it to please the bourbon you know, enthusiasts. They just did it to line their pockets a little more. Which we don't know that. For, we no, I mean, sure. don't know that for sure, but I mean, all signs are pointing towards that, right? So I, you know, I'm not afraid to say that either. So I think it's, it's a shame because honestly, the bourbon's great, right? I think, you know, Nick and Eric love straight from the barrel. I love gold. I think it's two of the best Blanton's examples out there. It's just a shame of how and when they chose to bring it back to the States. Well, ever since Kenny reminded me that on our 50th episode that, that uh, what was it, four years ago, Blake and I recommended Blanton's as an initial bottle to have. I'm not going to say anything about Blanton's anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'll say, I, I, it's, oh, you aren't really done, Brian? No, I'm, no, I'm done. I can't, oh, okay. <laughs> I can't so, top what I did four years ago. So I, I I will say like you know kudos to you Jordan for you know for for you know giving your your thoughts there on, on that I, I think that's very important like we are looking at a time that 
you were in a pandemic. We're in the middle of a trade war. Um, and you know, you, you brought up a very poignant you know, discussion. And then I started looking into, you know, sales data from, from Drizzly, which allowed me access to their sales data. Blends was in like their, I, I want to say it was in their top six hmm. of like best selling bourbons. I'm like, what is happening? You know, and I just, I just think, I think Blanton's is a, I, I think it is a conundrum that we cannot figure out. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't know if, even if the distillery can, uh, but I know who's taking advantage of it. And that's the distributors. Mm-hmm. I have on several accounts that distributors who represent Blanton's, which, you know, in turn, other products from, you know, the Sazerac line, if you want a bottle, if you want six bottles of Blanton's, you got to buy 10 cases of Fireball and four cases of Wheatley. And I mean, look, that's the business. That's the business. I don't think it's right. And some would argue, you know, it's not legal. It, it, it I think it varies per market. But um, to me, the the extension of them is smart business. The application of them into the market sucks because it is a, it is a hoof print on everybody uh, who wants a bottle and it, and it, it, anybody who wants to sell one, anybody who wants to get one, it, 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 it's a, it's a painful process. And, and I hate it all the way around and I don't know who's to blame, but, I know the demand is there, and so why not? So it's probably a good thing, Kenny, that we do have these new extensions of Blanton's because the the market demands it at least domestically, and it, I don't I don't think Jordan is wrong, and like the times uh, have impacted that we're seeing more of it here, and the extensions come here. I don't think he's wrong there, but at the same time, and don't get me wrong, I would love more Blanton's in my local store. I'd love that, even though it's not what I buy, but I would love that for my friends. So they stop fucking asking me for bottles of blank. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is Wait what it is. You see the secondary price on the December 5th, 2020 uh, dump date for Blanton's repeal day, <laughs> repeal day dump. There you go. <laughs> and I think that's, it's been a, it's been a great discussion and, you know, we, we never really know that the true, motive behind any of this so let's make sure we 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 put it out there that you know we're just this is all speculation speculation. all speculation in the day uh and you know we do have to give them credit that they did listen to a market people have been asking like when is golden straight from barrel going to come to the u.s and now that we're like yeah and then we're like wait a minute no 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 take it back take it back take it back (laughs) so we kind of like shot ourselves in the foot a little bit right so we just gotta we gotta keep that in mind and and no matter what they do in any line that they produce they can't keep it on the shelf even standard buffalo trace so I feel like they're trying. They're they're probably giving their best effort, and I think Blake said it forty two times on this podcast before. It's it's just a product of their success, and and I I I truly believe that what they have done, and, and maybe it's marketing, and actually they don't do a whole lot of marketing at all. It it's yeah. just it's good whiskey yeah. and very good very good bottling. So I, good I've said I've said this before, Kenny, but I think I think that the entire bourbon industry should follow Buffalo Trace's model, in that. Let's take a look at what they do with the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection. So they they don't none of those bourbons in that line have a flavored line. Every single thing that they do from a bourbon perspective is premium, super premium, with the exception of maybe uh, a benchmark or a Colonel Lee or something like that, which they're not promoting, they're not pushing. But Fireball is their breadwinner, and it's Canadian whiskey. Mm-hmm. They 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 focus so much on super premium. They don't give they don't ever want to come out with an eagle rare uh cinnamon flavored. Yet Evan Williams has like 15 flavors. Evan Williams eggnog, Evan Williams. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Wild turkey Jim. Well, yeah, they all do I, it. I I do like Evan Williams eggnog. I <laughs> I will say that. <laughs> but like what if what if Jim Beam were to have the equivalent of the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection. They could pull it off. They've got the stocks. They got the older rise. They got a weeded bourbon and a maker's mark. 
Uh, they got a high rye bourbon in, in uh, Old Granddad. And then they got a like kind of a more of a traditional bourbon in the basic Jim Beam. Why couldn't they pull off uh, something equivalent to the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection? My whole thought is, is that the entire bourbon industry has actually failed what the, the model that Buffalo Trace has presented into bringing bourbon to the next level from a quality perspective. And instead, they are actually focusing on kind of like the volume side, which Jack Daniels has done a brilliant job, you know, uh, fulfilling over the last 25 years. They are, no one is trying to actually, you know, capture that same level. They're just doing one off like limited editions here, limited edition there, a new one here, a spinoff there. But no one's kind of bringing that same level of intensity on the highly, highly intensely solid, beautiful, premium, super premium products that Buffalo Trace is doing. And while I hate what has happened with Blanton's and while I hate the like exceptionally hypeness that has come with everything that is attached to Buffalo Trace, I don't think that we can necessarily always blame them. I think we have to look at the model that they created as that should have been the model for bourbon for the last 15 years and no one else took up on it. No, completely. And, and that's a great point, Fred. Right. And if, where's the round of applause button? Like, is <laughs> yeah, you need, a, you need sound good. effects on this. I know. I, I mean, really, if there was, right, if you're going to label the year of 2020 to a bourbon distiller, it would be Buffalo Trace, right? My views aside on what I think the timing for blends, it's, it's great bourbon. It meets consumer demand. And even look at the St. Jude's auction that they're doing right now and participating in with their Stag Junior Barrel Proof, right? It's up to $76,500. There's still a few days to go in the auction. And that winner still has to buy the barrel. I mean, it's like Buffalo Trace mania here in the U.S. And kudos to them because they're they're meeting demand, well, trying to meet demand by bringing more stuff out to the market too. So, right, you, I mean, they can literally just throw anything out there right now and people go crazy for it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some more stuff out there. We're going to speed this up and kind of nail this and round it lightning out here, round, okay? Lightning round. Lightning round. You ready? Or just going to say hit or miss. Ready? Knob Creek 12 and 15 year releases. Hit, hit. Damn, I was gonna say miss because I hate I miss having those in the private barrel program. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All right. Wild Turkey Masters Keep Bottle and Bond 17 year. Hit. 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 All yeah. right. Rare breed rye. Hit. Major. Hit. I can go yeah. either way. Yeah, that's a hit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm pretty I, I liked it better than like the Elijah Craig spin-off into the rye, but um I don't like it better than the bourbon. So <laughs> wait, which one was this? Rare, rare breed rye. Rare breed rye. Miss. Ooh, there we go. All right. Old Forster birthday bourbon 2020. Didn't have it. Yeah, Didn't miss. Have it. Miss. Miss on our part as well. well I like no, I did have it. I don't remember it. I won't answer. <laughs> <laughs> it means it's a long, miss. Long night of tasting. Yeah. All right. Last <laughs> one. We already kind of talked about Elijah Craig Toasted Barrel, but let's, let's give this because I feel like this was the year it returned. Parker's Heritage. That's a yes. huge hit. Oh, that's a hit. I loved it. Yeah. Loved it, loved it, loved it. I'm kind of neutral on it. You know, I, I mean, it's not a hit. It's not a miss. It's to me, it's like uh higher proof, you know, Henry McKenna. So maybe I should say hit. Yeah. I, I feel like they've had they've had such mediocre years in the past, maybe four or five, that now there's finally one that is exciting once again. And this I, heavy I, I, char was so much better than the ride heavy char. Yeah, so much it, better. It, so much true. better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just but, didn't. But, okay, 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 guys. Come on. Okay. <laughs> this is not a heavy char. It's a five char. <laughs> heavy heavy char is like, I mean, it's like just a little bit over four. I mean, which is the basic standard. It's not a, I mean, it's not a heavy char. I mean, it's not. Heavy what's, heavy char char you, what's heavy char to you then? It's what Buffalo Trace did like. Five years ago, with the char number seven, where the fucking barrels were barely hanging on to the hoop because they were like charred so much. I mean, this is like this had a these barrels had a lot of life left in them. They weren't heavy charred; they were just a little extra crispy. <laughs> I love it. That's like, just the overdone yeah. bourbon. It's it's, yeah. not, it's slightly overdone. It's, it's slightly over. This is this is a this is a. This is a medium, a medium well. well. Yeah, it's yeah. a medium well. It's not, it's not well done. It's medium well. It all comes back to steak at, at Bourbon or Eats over there. Yeah. So it's perfect. By the way, 
Weber in the house or Weber? Oh, yeah, yeah, Weber. Yeah, that's – how do we get them to sponsor? Blackstone and Weber, I would, you know, in a heartbeat do a festival for that. <laughs> yeah, listen well, I, to it. We'll see. I got a guy. We'll get on it. There we go. So let's go ahead. We'll kind of wrap this up. Everybody stay in the chat. We'll, we'll probably hang out and talk a little bit more after this is over. But I want to say thank you all once again for coming and wrapping up. Man, this is a huge year for us. 50th Bourbon Community Roundtable. We're wrapping up with 2020 here, talking about some of the hits and misses that we had. And honestly, there I had a whole list of other things here that we just didn't have time to get to. So maybe we'll have a follow-up here. <laughs> Oh, a little bit. I mean, there's uh, what we had toasted barrel, there was Kentucky Owl Dry State, Angel's Envy. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in here. So, well, Dry State sucked. Uh, which one was the other one? Let's let's <laughs> let's, let's people let's just feed people to the, the Minic blog and they can go read about it all over there. How about yeah, that? I don't have a blog. What are you talking about? <laughs> By the way, I'm sorry, Kenny, for going off on rants and tangents and uh, history and stuff. I apologize. It's okay. Everybody loves a good little history. They're all good. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go ahead and close this out. You all know me and Fred, part of Bourbon Pursuit here, but Jordan, I'll let you go ahead and go next. Sure. This is Jordan, one of the three guys from Breaking Bourbon. You can find us uh, at breakingbourbon.com and on all the socials. And I uh, just wanted to wish everyone a happy holidays and New Year since it'll be the last time we're doing the roundtable this year. And um, hope you all drink some good bourbon over the next month. Blake. Yeah, uh, always fun to be here. Um, I'm Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. You can find me at either location, social media, Facebook pages, all that good stuff. So, yeah, since this is uh, the, the last one of the year, that's a little disappointing. You know, usually I like to get emotional and reflect on the year, but I feel like we're kind of early to do that in December, so I won't do it. But, no, always fun, guys. Thanks for having me. For sure. And Brian. All right. Thanks for having me again, uh, Brian, with Sippin' Corn on all the socials of Sippin' Corn and also online at bourbonjustice.com. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed Thanksgiving and uh, let's push through December here and get this the hell over and hope for a better 2021 for everybody. Amen. Uh, second, second times mm -hmm. to 100. Facts on facts right there. Mm -hmm. Let's get through 2020. And we will also be announcing here this week our Bourbon Pursuit end of the year charity fundraiser where we're going to have all the barrel picks that we've done throughout 2020. I believe there's going to be close to like 30 something bottles available. So make sure you go and check that out. I'll be dropping the link in the show notes, but I want to say thank you all once again for coming on to this episode, rounding it out for 2020. And as Brian said, let's get it over and cheers to a new year. Have a great weekend and repeal day, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. See you repeal day. Cheers.